Gaturu from Nairobi, Kenya, part of HGA um, International Community. She is in the room, brilliant speaker, brilliant facilitator, and I'm going to put you in spotlight. You are the moderator for this session. One second. Over, yeah, there, there you go. And then I have Killian Stokes. Killian is the CEO of Proudly Made in Africa. He is a man that is very knowledgeable about doing business in Africa, with Africa, and actually has a really good product from the, Af for the, Af from the African market, for an international market. It's Moye Coffee. It's my pleasure. Kilian, you're just behind, behind the, you have to kind of move forward so we can see you. I think that thing for some reason isn't working. Let me you, can, you can take it off. You can take it off so we can see you. It's more important to see you than to see her, Jenny. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the, yeah. So Keelan Stokes, he is highly knowledgeable. And I, I really ask you to connect with him online as well. Because when it comes to issues of trade justice, trade in Africa, he is he is an expert there. So Keelan, welcome. And Betty, Betty Sian, he, he, she is a fantastic businesswoman she has a product i wish i actually brought it from the kitchen i'm really proud of that product she's the owner of model food which is a um superfood proudly made in gambia right and i'm so proud of her product she's tenacious in her desire to see women empowered so there's betty and then i wonder if linda fernando is here linda i think is from mauritius i wonder if linda is in the room linda if you are in the room I've been trying to find you. Maybe you're not here for some reason. Oh, excuse me. We will go along with the people we have here. Um, Trust is not in the room as well. Trust is based in Zimbabwe. And Linda is, no, not Mauritius, Mozambique. And she's not in the room as well. Amama, she is busy. So over to you, Caroline, over to you. Um, apologies for spelling your name without the E. Sorry about that. Uh, not a problem at all. You are pronouncing it very well, Caroline, in the room. It's been an exciting, exciting space to just listen to the speakers that have spoken and to hear what great things are happening and could happen. And we're just about to have a discussion around technology, around interconnectedness, around opportunities, and of course, around COVID-19, because we cannot leave this space without having spoken about that. We are still in that space and we want to see how do we forge forward, how do we maximize opportunities? How do we grab what we need to grab? The speakers who've spoken before have talked about collaboration. They've talked about mental health and the importance of that in this business space. They've talked about what do we need to do to access markets? What challenges are we facing? And so we need to then just harness all of these opportunities and run with them. And so we have four areas to tackle and we'll do that right away. And I'll start with you, Kilian. Please yeah. tell us what you think we need to do to get together, to be more collaborative in this interconnected world. How do we get our businesses to be, have more presence so that we can navigate better in this complex global market? Is it even complex in the first place? What do you think, Killian? Wow, that, that's a very big question. Um, uh, Phil, thank you first for being here. Uh, it's very interesting. Such a great uh, session here. So much energy, great questions from, from uh, a lot of the, the panel and, and in the comment box. Um, I can hear myself talking. I don't know if that's, that's somebody's... That's the feedback coming from you, Kim. That's coming from me? Yeah, cool, cool. It's gone now. Okay. Um, yeah, Carolyn, I think um, it's it will. You, you need to have a clear idea in the beginning. I mean, some if I could just some of the, the points that came up earlier on. I, I did believe that price and quality is really important, and quality even in Ireland we don't do quality enough. Like if I want to sell to the French market, if I identify a product, let's say it's perfume, or let's say it's Irish butter or Irish beef. If I want to sell to the French market, I need to understand the consumer there. I need to understand how French people live. I can't just look at Irish consumers and go, oh, we eat spuds and we eat steak and we put butter on our spuds and I'll sell that to the French. That's not how they eat. That's not what they want. So I think as a community, you folks here have a foot in both camps. You have a foot 
in whether you know you're personally African or your family or connections, you know how amazing the products are. You know the opportunity, the talent that is there on the continent. And somebody earlier on said about you know um, if if you're uh, you know you're overlooked often. That is a huge opportunity. You can see what most like so many Europeans and American, be they entrepreneurs or consumers, they do write off Africa. The for too long the reputation of Africa has been connected with charities and with poverty and all of that god awful stuff. And it's not to ignore that there's challenges that humans and and some of the people on the continent do. You know, half of the people maybe on the continent have have those challenges, but the other half are booming. The other half are rocket scientists. The continent has taken off, and you you know, so that I think that's a real opportunity. That's to, you, you can I there's a, there's a quote I often come to Steve Martin's quote: "Be so good they can't ignore you," and and it's what I love about what we do with Moi Coffee because a lot of the times when we started out, people didn't think coffee came from Africa. They didn't know. And they they thought about Brazil and South America, and they also thought their coffee had to be roasted in Dublin for it to be fresh. So they had loads of prejudice against product that was manufactured in Africa. They had loads of prejudice around quality, and it allowed you to kind of have a ta a surprise moment and really shock people. And I've I've experienced it with Michael's beautiful sauces, you know, and and. I love food and I totally and I keep buying people African cookbooks for for Christmas, my family members. It is, and when I go on trips to Africa, when I'm fortunate, the foods out there that you don't get over here, I think there's so much opportunity in, in that sector. Um, but not as one entrepreneur in Kenya told me, not to sell beer to Irish people. Don't like no more than I would try to sell wine to the French. Don't go to the best beer manufacturers in the world and try to sell them Tusker beer or whatever is good bell you know from uganda because you're going to lose in that game but you bring amazing coffee from kenya and from rwanda and, and malawi and, and ethiopia obviously and you will knock the socks off brazilian and coffee and all of those south american coffees the best coffee in the world comes from from africa so i i think um i i, I and i'm, I'm going to just answer this i'm going to throw uh, keep going if you don't mind um but like something, there was some of the points earlier on about Afro pessimism, and I put it in the in the comments here. We had Irish pessimism. We're Catholics. We have so much Catholic guilt. The 1980s in Ireland, when I was growing up, was miserable. 21 percent. Uh, the, the unemployment was really high. I think unemployment was was 21 percent, and we had 18 percent uh, inflation. We had high. Infl it was really expensive. Nobody was an entrepreneur. We had loads of um, high tax. And we had real insecurity compared to the British, who were so sophisticated and so much better than us. But little by little, we we won some sports activities. We had the likes of U2. We got into the, the World Cup. The country gained certain level of, of confidence. And our diaspora in the 1990s, who had gone away and worked in big companies in America and England, wherever, started to come home. And we started, we really tapped in as Irish people into the experiences we had over there. And we always had a hard work ethic because of the, the hardship of the 80s. Our people who, who did have jobs worked hard. Um, so I see parallels there. And I, I think, you know, um, sorry, I'm just going to have to let a dog out here for one second. I think we can now you choose to go ahead. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of parallels in that, but you've got to move beyond it. And I saw somebody else mentioned that the mental health aspect it is such a tough journey being an entrepreneur. And, you know, I appreciate as 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 kind of a, a, a migrant coming to Ireland that that you're you have that element of I'm an outsider. I don't necessarily know how things operate here. There's there's maybe an added layer. But even as somebody who is from Ireland, who set up a company here in Ireland, you you will have that imposter. You will have that insecurity in yourself where everybody around you thinks you're crazy. Even your family are saying, why are you doing this? The entrepreneurial journey is kind of universal and you have to keep pushing on, be, you know, overcome the, the naysayers, the, the no's, the slam doors, the failed, uh, um, you know, the failed pitches and all that. So I think as an entrepreneur, you live it. Everything you do, I used to go running. Your, your exercise was about staying fit and keeping your mind. The TV programs, I'd constantly watch things like Gladiator, all of these, whatever, wherever you get it from, these movies where you have the hero on a journey, you just take that inspiration or from music, whatever gets you through it, whatever allows you to believe in yourself, 
and keep going and ignore those those um those no's that's that's a universal thing so i do think the mental health is is huge um i suppose it, it does come back to though your idea knowing that and and you have to be honest with yourself you can't just believe in yourself and that's the only thing you do have to listen you do have to get feedback on whether it's samosas or whatever does the mark is there a market out there for this is there an opportunity now i'm not saying you need 100 people to tell you they love samosas if you know that samosas are fantastic like steve jobs always said or or was it uh, ford who said if i asked the market they would have told me they wanted a faster horse not a car so the consumers don't always know. We as consumers didn't know we needed an iPad till it arrived. So the consumer isn't always right, but you do need to be able to figure out that your your product really has a, mar a market, that there is a need you're fulfilling. What is that need? Um, personally, I think there's a huge opportunity and need for African-based healthy snacks and foods and different, people really want to move away from wheat and dairy. So this, and, and so much of what, the people of the continent eat is not those things you know we see teff uh and and, and stuff in, in in ethiopia there's so much other options that i think can be brought um yeah sorry and and but just one thing i do say about quality when i started out with moi coffee i brought 12 coffees from east africa from ethiopia kenya and uganda and 10 of the 12 were rejected the quality mm. wasn't good enough for, for the Irish or European market. And I often say to, to coffee entrepreneurs I meet is, you know, the market, Europe is so far away. If you are, if you do have a brewery in, in Kenya, don't sell to the, the Europeans, sell to the Tanzanians and the Ethiopians and the Ugandans. And, you know, there's there's a billion people, soon to be two and three and four billion on the continent. Right. That's the first market. Oh, oh, oh. Got it. Got it. Absolutely, absolutely. You have spoken about knowing and understanding the customer, knowing the market, keep going, understand the product, understand who you are selling to and why, collaborate so that you can we can get the synergies of all being together. I think you have great points there that um, are very powerful and punchy. Let's hang with that for a little bit as we talk to Betty. Betty, we want to hear from you. What do you think we could do about the digital space and just getting that to influence growth, to influence our transnational trade opportunities. Where does digital sit in all of this? Because our previous speakers have spoken about breaking boundaries, about getting our psyche up and getting moving. Where, where does digital sit in all this, Betty? What do you think? Thank you, Caroline. Uh, thank you, Toluani, for having me. Uh, what a fantastic event. And thank you to the speakers that spoke before us. Yes. Um, I am based in Ireland. My products are produced in the Gambia. I own a brand called Maudo. Um, all the products are proudly made in the Gambia. Um, to answer your question, digital, um, the way it actually um, helps in the products that we produce, let's say the Gambia, for example, for example, for the first time, we're having internet banking. We're having um, products being sold online. We have online, um, we have e-commerce. Gambia is one of the smallest countries in, in, in West Africa. And we're always last in anything that, that, you know, that actually starts. So we're always the last to, to get internet banking, to get e-commerce. And um, for the first time, when I went um, when I went to the Gambia about three months ago, I was just really excited and passionate about the whole thing of exporting products from the Gambia, processing products in the Gambia and selling them in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. As Killian said, sometimes we can actually sell to each other in the Gambia as well as within the continent. Selling outside the Gambia and selling out outside the continent gives us the opportunity of having um, foreign exchange, which is quite a big difference from selling in your local currency. But it's always good to start nationally. Like I sell my products in five supermarkets in the Gambia, simply because it's really difficult to, to get into Ireland. It's really difficult to, to get into other markets. It's a process. It takes time. And technology does help us. So at the moment, what we're doing in the Gambia is working with local local women, um, 
mostly women, we only work mostly with women, men sometimes for mostly women. And what we do is we gather women together from the rural areas and we buy our raw materials from them, we produce them and we start selling to the supermarkets as well as online. And there has been a phenomenal change in the social uh, economic viability of our women in the Gambia. It's been about two and a half, three years. And the difference that has made in their lives is unbelievable, it's phenomenal. So, and that has been helped through collaboration, as you, as you mentioned, as well as, you know, through digital, through technology selling online. A little bit difficult because of the infrastructure in the Gambia, the infrastructure issues, but it's it's doable. It is being done and lives are being changed. So we're coming, we've come a long way and we've come a, we have got a long way still to go. And I'm wow. just really excited about this whole thing. So process. Wow. Very exciting. I'm just going wow to all the things that you are saying. You're speaking about the grassroots. You're speaking about what we say in Kenya is bottom up. And you're speaking about being able to create change at a local level and then grow it regionally from local products and local parties doing what they do best and then transporting and exporting that all over the world. Very exciting. The Gambia, we, we, are, we are traveling. We are traveling in this space. If we look at all the geographies represented mm -hmm. here, this is technology at work. And let me ask you the next question before I go to Kilian, because you've started to speak into it. I wanted to ask about, when we talk about transnational trade, it sounds big. It looks like it's for big players and big people with big pockets. But you're talking about small enterprises, cottage industries, medium enterprises. What, what opportunities exist at that level that we can then kill? What, what do you see? What has been your experience and what's your advice? Betty? You know, I always say, we have no idea how fortunate we are. And we we still don't know the resources, the amount of resources we have that can enable us to actually build wealth, mm. both in Africa and in, in the diaspora. Mm. Speaking about the Gambia, as I said, it's a very small country, one of the smallest countries in West Africa. Mm. Speaking about the Gambia alone, the opportunities I see there is just unbelievable. So, as I said, working with women in you know at grassroots level, and the change it has brought about, the the economic viability it has you know it has brought about as well. It's um it's really important that um, we we work together, working right. together collaborating, extremely important. Very. And these are exciting times. Very, um, very, very, so. very exciting times. It reminds me of the proverb that says that if you want to go fast, you walk alone. And if you want to go far, you walk together. I, I, I love this platform. I love the opportunity here. And we have, I have two former colleagues who just moved to Cork in October. And I very quickly gave out uh, Tolu's contact because these are Kenyans out here doing their things in the energy space. And what, what collaboration could possibly happen with all of the things that we are doing here together? So it's very exciting to hear the things that you are doing and how these opportunities could, could be known, felt, and had. Because just as the earlier speaker said, the challenges are all the same. She was talking about the challenges, Lerato in South Africa, about access to markets, access to information, access to capital, same thing. That's the Kenyan story. That's the Gambian story. That's the Nigerian story. It's all of it's the Moroccan story. It's all of Africa's story. And we're here to see how we can move and shake things, maximize opportunities, and see what next. Kilian, we need to talk about COVID. I know we want to put it past us. I know we want to put that era and that season behind us, but we are still under the burden and the weight of, of COVID and its effects. What, what lessons do you feel we could pick from that? Because lessons learned is more important than just lamenting and dwelling on the past. What could we pick from that and move forward to maximize? Yeah, look, COVID was a, a almost once in a hundred year global pandemic. 
its effects were were phenomenal. It shut down economies. It shut down our our supply systems and stuff. Um, and and it was terrible. And it certainly, in my experience here in Ireland, it was the first kind of catastrophe like that that I've encountered in in fifty one years. But people in the continent of Africa have endured epidemics, pandemics, local challenges that they that on, local entrepreneurs there i mean look at power outages you know um like at our coffee factory local entrepreneurs on the continent have are, have far more resilience i think and are more aware that sh real shocks can come along look at the people in malawi i mean i don't think anybody in ireland would be aware of it but the level of devastation of the storm that hit malawi last year um massive destruction and so there will always be, and you know, for our business in Moi in coffee, uh, COVID, we ninety percent of our business was coffee at work. We were selling into tech companies, and back in February of twenty twenty, I had just flown over to London, and I had closed a deal with um, the 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 Innocent Smoothies, and we were selling our coffee into fee. We were going to supply the the staff, and we were talking to them about potentially supplying our coffee as an ingredient into innocent smoothies. And then I came home on that flight and the, the Taoiseach here closed the schools on the Thursday. And effectively, every company in Ireland closed the offices on the Friday. That was 90% of our revenue, 90% of our business, all for cliff overnight. So we had to scramble during COVID. We suddenly, internet was not a thing. We, had, we used to make 100 or maybe 150 euro a month. It paid our electricity bill, we'll say. But then it became 90% of our business during COVID. So those two years, we really had to ramp up. And, and today it's it's come back down as people return to the offices. And it's become, we now have this new channel that's a very large and profitable channel in online. We've become experts in online because we had to, like necessity is the mother of invention and all that. So challenge often, if you can get a product down off a, a mountain and get through monsoon season and get it, get truckloads of ingredients from a rural part of a of a, an African country that maybe doesn't have perfect infrastructure, you can and you can get that on time to your customers and supermarkets in the capital city or for to the port and, and all that stuff, then you've a lot of resilience already baked into your entrepreneurship. Um so I I I don't the COVID thing like okay Ukraine is coming along and you know and there's probably more, there'll be another thing at one point, there was a, a tanker got stuck. We were shipping coffee from Kenya and it would go to Saudi Arabia and then through the, the Suez Canal and, and to Europe. And that time the tanker got stuck there. All our bags were on that tanker. So we suddenly had to scramble and our next shipment went out in plain white bags. And we eventually produced a, a postcard. It was an aerial shot of the tanker wedged in the canal. And we just put an arrow on it. We said, this is where your cotton moi bag is. You know, so... Our customers didn't mind. It was a, it was a shock. They they because we had a good relationship with our customers, they leaned in and they supported us as a business. So yeah. I think if you have a really strong relationship with your customers, if you know them and they know you, and you are authentic as a business, then your community will come together. Correct. We can navigate any storm if we communicate. If we have excellent customer service that leads to excellent customer experiences, yeah. our customers will be able to walk with us through anything. I want to have the final parting shot from the two of you before we ask if anybody has any questions to throw them in the chat. Uh, let's have the final remarks. Betty, access to information is still a limiting factor, it's a barrier. Even just as we've spoken here from the different uh, speakers, we are learning new things. We think on this platform, we deem ourselves to be knowledgeable, we deem ourselves to to know and understand things and to be generally well read and well informed. And yet we're learning great and new things on this part. How do we get this communication, this information to where it matters most? Betty? That's an area that's 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 a very um uh, that's an area that people are having a lot of difficulty in. That's uh, you know, just getting the information we need. Living in Ireland, listening to um, the speakers before us um, and the challenges people face, 
you know, the setting up a company, the setting up a, a business in Ireland, especially if your your business is based in Africa or you get your um your raw materials from Africa. Mm -hmm. It's it can be very challenging. Um, I am still in the process of setting up in Ireland, but I I basically gave up because of the red tape, um, mm. the discrimination. It's just really disheartening and mm. um, it's really difficult. Mm. But it, it's, see, as I always say, life is full of challenges and we have to see it. Uh, this is what we want to do, myself and other entrepreneurs, other uh, entrepreneurs of African descent. And this is what we're going to do. Um, we have this opportunity in the continent. We have all these resources and we're mm -hmm. going to persevere and we're going to keep on working hard to get to where we want to be. So, um, uh, as I said, the challenges, we just try to overcome them. Um, I'm just keep on working hard. Just wherever we need to find the information, that's where we're going to find the information. And this is what we're going to do, and we're going to go ahead. Right. This is what we're going to do. This is how we are going to go ahead. Very inspiring. May your voice be heard in all the platforms that it needs to be heard, Betty. More power to you. We are right behind you. You're speaking to all of these people, and once this goes online, it creates even a bigger and, and more informed populace May your voice really cut through the, the red tape and the challenges. And we are seeing great potential and great results coming. Thanks for sharing of yourself and of your journey. We are more inspired today as a result of it. Kilian, talk to us, final parting short, partnership, collaboration. What is your take on that before we yeah. hand over? The partnership, collaboration, I would say stakeholders is the key word. In, mm. in coffee, I look at the coffee supply chain as having six steps. You have the farmers, you have the harvesting, which involves the community. You have the, the packaging or the production. You know, we roast the coffee and we package it at the in our roastery in, in Kenya. And then the fourth stage is the freight, shipping it from there to here. The fifth stage is sales, whether we're selling it through our, our, our own team, through the website or through shops. Um, your sales channel and then the sixth is where the customer actually consumes the product at that customer stage what's really important is quality that's how you connect with the customer if you give them a quality uh, product that they consume then you've you've added value to them you're about adding value to them then they're willing to look back through the value chain at the other mm -hmm. stages then they will connect to the fact that the way in which you farm is as ethical as possible. As Betty right. said, that you're you're even the way you work with the community, you're creating jobs, you're empowering people, you're giving incomes to people who perhaps beforehand didn't have that. You will connect the consumer back to that by telling that authentic story. And and with us, our production is is in Africa. It's where I think the future for many of the entrepreneurs here and, and for many entrepreneurs should be. It's yeah. also connecting that those jobs and th that those partners at that stage, bringing that to the to the consumer. Um, the, and the sales thing is, is the piece, whatever about the freight, if you're using a, a Kenyan company or a British company to do your freight, it's 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 probably the least sexy stage in, in the journey of coffee, for example. Mm -hmm. but the sales thing is about your personal network. It's, I mean, I do it all the time, even now, I'll get a machine, put it in the back of my car, I'll go and I'll pitch, I'll make coffees for whoever needs a coffee. I will go if there's a sale to be made. It's about shoe leather. It's, it's old fashioned sales. And so at all of those six stages, there's an element of partnership, but beyond mm -hmm. partnership is, is the value of wanting to add value to all of the people involved in this and not exploiting anybody. That will resonate. That will resonate. Adding value, adding value, adding value, adding value at, from end to end at each and every stage all the partnerships in place, all the quality of the products in place, how are we adding value? That's what you're calling us to do and the action that is required. Yes, you wanna say the last um, thing? Yeah, sorry, one last thing in terms of like a stakeholder, we're talking about people there, but in terms of this time of sustainability and climate change, you know, the contribution that the planet gives to all of us, we are all here because of people and nature. And right. very 
so in Africa. And with this, as the continent really grows and thrives this century, the risk is that the beautiful habitats, the beautiful forests, where the landscape of the continent will get further exploited in uh, as as growth kicks in. And, and in the case of coffee, all the regions that our coffee comes from, they have lost 25% of their trees in the last 20 years. Yeah, and yeah. The problem I have is my consumers don't, coffee drinkers in Europe here don't know are, are so oblivious to that and tea drinkers. So we have to connect in with the earth as well. That is a stakeholder yes. that has to connect with the products. All right, all right. Planet and profits, we must find how to sustainably have profits, add value and still take care of the planet. What a great part in short, we must think through sustainability. Great stories have been told today. Betty, we need to hear your story. Killian, we need to hear your stories. We are accused of not telling our stories. Tolu, we need to tell our stories. There are fantastic so me, stories in here. Let me hand this back over to you. I see the question on the in Ireland and Africa. Are there challenges? How can it be dealt with if there's any? Please, over to you. Any of our panelists can step in. Over to you, Caroline. You can continue. So we have just... Michael, at the end, you are talking about uh, logistics end-to-end. -end. Maybe you can beat that up a little bit. And then, Betty, you can tell us about the project, the product. Um, Michael? Can you hear me? Challenges? Yeah? What, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you, uh, Tolunwani. Thank you uh, for the question. Now, the, the, one of the challenges that I have, you know, having to, you know, import products from from uh, Africa, it, it, it's mostly um, things going through DAFA, because usually I do import my product from a company in the UK that. It, that, that gets this product from Africa. It was easier to do it with UK then. But after Brexit, things just change. Yeah. You know, the, the prices just went up and there was more forms to fill. Um, you know, tariff and things like that and VAT is just is just a real challenge. So what I did was I said, okay, why don't I go to Africa myself? You know, because I'll go to Africa. I can understand them, they can understand me, they look like me and, and things like that, instead of going through a third party. So after doing that and things coming there, I asked to go through the uh, Department of Agriculture in Ireland. And it was a bit difficult at first because, you know, you have to register, you have to fill in forms, you have to do things like that because it's all about, you know, you know, you know, credibility, um, um, where this product is from and things like that. But when all these, you know, challenges are, you know, you know, sorted, it was much more easier to actually, you know, import your product from Africa than I expected because I've been spending money with this company in the UK, and they're like, the price was like like three times. I was paying three times the price. But when I go to Africa and actually, you know, you know, import this product myself, it was actually, you know, easier than I than I expected. But product has to go through that farm, and they have their processes and you know their time things you have to do once you do the right thing um it was much more easier than than, than i expected so the challenges are there but you just have to you know understand there are challenges and walk through the process and, and things will be easier and with time things get easier i want them knowing you you build up that credibility if your product come in all they need to do is verify where this is coming from and and what product is this? And your things come in now with my products coming in. It's not. It doesn't take more than three days. Usually, it take about a month when I started. But now, since we've created that that relationship with the uh, Department of Agriculture, they know where this is coming from. They 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 just say, okay, now we, we've done this before. We know what to do, okay. and it becomes easier. So don't be afraid to actually, you know, you know, you know, try, you know, all the routes. Yeah. Great, great response there. I think there's so much learning because there's no need for another entrepreneur, another business, another um, institution to go through the problems you have gone through when you've burnt in that fire and come out more bronze, more shiny, more, more, more compact, and we can learn from that. So these collaborative efforts are really important for us to keep sharing and keep building each other. This platform's biggest take-home today is how much we need to build, how much we need to uplift and support. 
Betty, have you had any challenges in the logistics process you want to share with us? Yes, yes. Um, our challenge is in the Gambia. Um, the main one is because Gambia is so small and um, just because we don't have that government backing, it's really difficult to test the products in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you're bringing products to Europe, it needs to go through certain quality control. So uh, most of the time, what we do is to go to Senegal to get the products tested. And it takes forever when it gets to Senegal. Mm -hmm. So we just had a meeting with the Minister of Trade in the Gambia, and um, they're just putting you know, a structure in place whereby we can have the products tested in the Gambia. In mm -hmm. fact, as we speak, um, we have a group of women, members of AWEP, that's the African Women Entrepreneurship um, Project, uh, the Gambia chapter. We're just getting a container together and putting in our products. They are all supervised, they're all quality controlled, and um, we're hoping in the next month we should be able to load the container and send it over to the UK. Right. Because the UK are more receptive of these products than, the, than Ireland is. It will take a while for, for Ireland to get there. So in the meantime, we're going to use UK and we invited women from all, you know, all walks of, of life really to come together so we can, you know, put this container together, send it over and then be able to, to sell the products. Right. Um, so that's, that's one challenge we had that has been, um, that's hopefully, you know, uh, sorted. Uh, yeah. Super, super to hear the navigating in there, the looking for solutions, being solution oriented, coming together to put the container, finding different routes and the learnings that lessons learned, lessons learned. So you will, this will be a victory story. We will wait to hear about it. Kilian, you look like you want to say something briefly. Just, yeah, just, you know, I guess with that, it's about the quantity. You know, if you're shipping over a whole container, that's a lot of money. It, it for it for the, the the for the product coming such a far distance, economies of scale. You need a large bulk, uh, and then the challenge is when it arrives here, you want to sell it pretty fast. You don't want product mm -hmm. dying on your shelves. So at different stages of the business, when we started out, we used to every month have a room full of coffee, and I panic because I'm like, I hope we can sell this coffee fast enough. And and now we have the opposite. We were so successful there. Like I hope our shelves don't run empty. So it's it's one or the other, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's and there. To yes, Betty. yeah. And quickly there on um, sending a container, a whole container, mm -hmm. as Kilian just um, pointed amazing. out. What we actually did was we are working with women who have actually done this in the Gambia. They've been doing this for the past twenty years, mm -hmm. so they have become our mentors. You know, people mm -hmm. like us who are new in this journey. So they are our mentors. Mm -hmm. And they have actually linked us up with people in in UK that made the order. So basically, the container is made to order. It gets there, and they're all ready to. You know what I mean? Like we're not going to be selling or going around looking for customers. The customers are there already. So it is really important. We're very selling to African shops, the wholesalers, um, and, yeah. and the like. Very, very important. You've spoken about mentorship. It echoes what um, the original speaker, Dolap, was talking about, mentorship, mentorship, mentorship. And that's that's coming out very strongly here. I think we need to ride on that, hang on that, and mentor others as we go along as well. I think all the speakers and the panelists are, are um, inborn mentors. We have work to do. We have great things to deliver. This summit, this conference is um, just a, an indicator that um, there is still work to be done. We need to speak more often and do this more often, Tolu. Amanda is saying here, great conversation, a lot of information. We'll be going back to listen to the recordings. Yes, indeed. This is like a tutorial. This, this entire summit is like a tutorial. We'll go back and take lots of notes. Back to you, Tolu. I think um, we've had a great conversation here, and we are very excited about it. Thank you, Caroline. Absolutely. Um, it's been very insightful. Thank you, Killian, and thank you to Betty. Uh, we definitely will be calling on you to share more of your experiences and share more of your insight. Thank you so much. Yes, we are about the end. We're just 
on the Delta 7 and our target was 7, 7 p.m. Now, I just wanted to show you, the, I don't know if you can see it from here, Betty's product. Oh, you can't see because of my, right. um, because of my back, virtual background. But anyway, I have Betty's product. Oh, yeah, you can see now. Yeah, this is uh, Moringa. And so lo lovely packaging here, everything. So, yes, I always keep it as if I'm, you know, I, I, I am part of the success story, but I always keep it there just to show people, like brag about, you know. But uh, there you go. <laughs> so well done to everybody. I'm going to have, I wonder if we have any other questions that we want to put out there. This conversation is going to continue. I'm just going to let you know that we've added you because you subscribed to this webinar. We've added you to our mailing list and we are going to be sending you once a week, maybe sometimes once in two weeks, information, fund information, inf relevant information as we get them from different parts of Africa and of course from Ireland as well. So if you are not interested in receiving mail from us, please feel free to unsubscribe. It will be at the end of the mail that you receive. So feel free to unsubscribe. You can also link us with us with us in another way. Now I'm going to put here uh, links to our social media platforms. I hope that you can do us the honor of uh, following us or linking up with us on social media. You have the, the IG platform, Facebook, Twitter. We're just about starting to tweet. Not that we really like tweeting, but we'll get used to it. And then LinkedIn, of course. So please follow us on social media. We'll be really grateful for that. Over to Mike Onalimi, a very dear brother and friend. I salute him. I'm so proud of him for all he's achieved. He's going to give us the closing remarks or closing note, keynote for the next five or so minutes. And then I hand over to one of the board directors, Coach Tinu Adegwe, who is going to give us closing remarks, thanking us and everything. So over to you, Mike Onalimi. <laughs> 